Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 42. Very important number for nerds. Yeah, the meaning of life. And everything, right? And everything. Here with us today in the studio, and by studio I mean the game room, slash office, slash dining room, is the game designer, board game person, Isaac Shalev. We're very excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I like to go by noted board game personality, Isaac Shalev. Thank you for uh, bringing me on. I don't I don't know that I can be expected to carry a number like 42 all on my own. Life, the universe, everything. That's a lot. So I think we can do it. Well, well, there's a bunch of us here, so so I think maybe all together we can do it. Yes. Here with us also are usuals. We have Matt. Hey. And Orion. Hello. And this is going to be a fun one. This was kind of thrown together at the last minute. Uh, Isaac, you posted on Twitter that you were going to be in the Boston area. And you're like, is anyone around not at BGG Con? And I responded. And then I had a slight moment of panic of like... <laughs> What if he thinks this is some, like, what if he doesn't, like, know who I am? <laughs> well, and I, I have listened to the show, you know, so I knew who you were. I remembered that a little while later. voice in my ears. <laughs> but I did have the moment of, I'm just going to go to this house and hope I don't get murdered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was an we intense... We hurt you. The Boston weather may, but... but yeah, yeah, we're yeah. getting our first snow right now, which is very early in the year. <laughs> yeah. It is a little early for snow, but uh, I was not really concerned so much about the weather as much as, you know, the board gaming community is very welcoming and it's wonderful and people are friendly and open and all the rest of that. But there's still the going to somebody's house whom you've never met before. Yeah. And what if it's a murder shack? You never know. It could be. And it's Boston. I don't trust any of you here. But, but none of us are from Boston. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. I'm from California. Orion is from Seattle, and Matt is from the Pittsburgh area. We'll it's, say we all hate the Patriots. <laughs> Indeed, you know. Tom Brady sucks. Indeed, yes. So you're you're safe from Boston orneriness. <laughs> Ironic that Mark is the one saying that you're safe from orneriness. Hey, I'm not that bad. <laughs> I'm not that bad most of the, of the time so we're just gonna talk about board game stuff i don't really have much of an agenda here like i said this was kind of thrown together at the last minute we did just finish playing the newest i think or second newest ryan lockett game empires of the void 2 for the first time i think he has he's since had a newer one like the that kids game the target release he had a mega land uh, yeah which was the target exclusive uh, there may have been one or two others somewhere along the line. Yeah, he's those. pretty prolific. Yeah, that, that guy just keeps making good games. Which, which you said that he does everything for his games, correct? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, he does the art which and the design. Seems like it would take ten times as, as long. Um, well, I assume he's full time at it now. Yeah, so he's full time. Uh, I think his wife also helps run the company. Uh, but I think does... she does a lot of the customer relations. Like I had, I had a question about one of the Kickstarters, and she was the one who responded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's right. But you know, he does the illustration. He does the graphic design. Um, if you go to the conventions, he's at the booth, showing and teaching, and so on. Uh, really, really nice guy, and just a phenomenal talent. I mean, his illustrations. You know, he builds these incredible worlds, mm -hmm. and he also does a lot of the writing. Although recently, he's teamed up with um, Alf Seeger, who has done uh, quite a few games. He did Fantastica um, and a few others. So the two of them are sort of jamming on it. And they both have like these dreamlike worlds. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, I, I, I've I mentioned this before, but I absolutely love the very whimsical, kind of different take on fantasy that, mm -hmm. that he creates with his games. You didn't tell me that this was a, a one of his games when we brought it out to the table and I had forgotten. Mm -hmm. And immediately when I looked at my player board, I saw the, um, I forget what race I was, but it was some awesome space fair fairing race. And immediately, it was like, this is definitely from the guy who did Above and Below. Um, yeah, yeah. It's that, it's that kind of whimsy. It was kind of cool seeing it in space. Yeah. I mean, we still got the, the frog people. Yep. Uh, which has been in all of the games I've played of his. Who were victorious, not to put too fine a point on it. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I was the humans. We failed. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it's cool because he's got, like, the non-Tolkien-esque fantasy. Right. But yeah. it's still whimsical in the way that, like, The Hobbit is. You know, there's... there's it's a, it's a it reminds me more of, of like, Japanese-style uh, Miyazaki, almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, but still even different from that. Yeah. In the way he does it. I, I think a lot of people go for cutesy fantasy, and it can feel really generic. But I think Ryan does a unique job with it. He really does stand out. He, he creates worlds. And I think it's not just the art style, although he's very consistent about it, right? Um, I think it's also, he names characters and people and stories. And I think my favorite touch in the whole game, I don't know if you, you all noticed this as much, was when you play the action cards, the action cards start with the word I. Yeah. Right? I you know, help out the uh, the smugglers and gain influence on a planet. Mm-hmm. That really, it's non-gamey. You know what I mean? It's not right. help smugglers gain a thing. It, it's personal. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that kind of draws you into the world in, in a similar way that I, I felt drawn into the near and far of a of verse. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Where you're not playing a it's not a role playing game. There's there's nothing really mechanically that makes it that, but it draws you in uh, that with that sort of touch. Yeah, and I mean you can't deny that the art is is amazing. Unfortunately, though, I wouldn't say we had the greatest time on our first play of Empires of the Void too. It was like we, we're all learning it from the rule book right off the bat. I had glanced through the rule book maybe three or four months ago, but hadn't remembered a whole lot about it. And that's a bulky game in terms of it's it's almost it was almost fantasy flight-esque in terms of very small minutia we had to keep looking up of okay what happens when the deck runs out or what happens when you are retreating through the space octopus where if you voluntarily went through it you'd have to roll a die and kind of like questions about when precisely does this trigger? It could be one right. of four options. I think my favorite one was uh, the word gain. On oh, a card. yes. The card said gain this yeah. you know, unit. And it wasn't clear if that meant put it on the board and if so, where? Or did it mean put it in your supply so that you could be able to purchase it later? Uh, there there yes. was a lot of that throughout the rule book, right? There was uh, building a building. Right, the first line in the rule book around building a building was "build it," but without any <laughs> yes. sense of where or how. I, I got to tell you, I'm out of patience for these kinds of issues, not only in new games but especially in second editions, mm. because all sure. of these yeah. issues should have surfaced in Empires of the Void One, or as we call it, A New Hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's not like I've had a problem like that with Red Revving games before either i mean this one the ones we own are above and below and near and far now this one and this one is certainly a step above those in terms of its complexity but the inconsistency with the way it worded things and what really got me going was that it's one of those rule books where it has the main text and then it has like examples set aside in in the graphic design which is fine if it only does examples there, but it was doing key rules in these boxes. And a couple of times I missed a key rule because I just didn't bother reading the boxes because I thought it was all examples. Yeah, this is one of those things about rulebook usability where we all thought that one thing was true and discovered another thing was true. So I remember uh, talking with other rulebook editors couple of years back and talking about, you know, what do you do when you really have an important rule, a key thing? How do you make sure to draw people's attention to it? And they'd say, oh, you know, put it in a call out box, change the color, change the... And what we have found is that when people are scanning rules for an answer, they skip over anything that doesn't look like the regular text. Mm, Yeah. So all those tools that we think we have at our disposal for calling attention to something end up being signals to people to ignore them. And we got to write our rules knowing that that's going to happen. Well, I mean, you can't have the, you can't have examples, which frankly, you know, are, are optional in rule books, be in the same style of box. Like they can't be in the same the same, I don't know what yeah, I'm looking The font or typeface. Yeah, sure, or, yeah. You know, all that stuff. Right? Sure, you maybe. distinguish them. Maybe 
you know, maybe you dis- distinguish examples and key rules, but they have to be distinct from each other mm-hmm. as well as from the main body of text or else it's, it, it doesn't work at all. And as much as it can be kind of a headache and troublesome to get through kind of a GMT rulebook with all the sub points and sub sub points and everything, at least you are confident that everything has been explained in that section of the rules. They're hard to read through the first time, but you don't have these problems of not knowing where to look for something because everything is organized so very well. Yeah, I mean, rulebooks do have to do two things. They have to be reference manuals, but they also have to be teaching guides. Mm -hmm. And those two things are in opposition to one another because the way that we learn is not by exhaustively listing all of the possible rules that can occur in this particular instance, right? We often learn by first hearing the general case, then hearing some specifics, then drawing back out to the general case. One of the things that a lot of us, I think, know about when you learn a game is You learn the rules, and then after you learn the rules, you sort of say to yourself, okay, so if I want to score the victory points, I need to move the units into the space, but then I still am going to need to have gold to pay for the building that I'm going to build in the space. So right now, to start the game, what I should do is go get money before I go conquer things, so that I'll be right, and you unwind the game. Yeah. Because that's what it really means to learn how to play. It's not the procedural, I know which units are allowed to move where. It's the... How do I formulate a plan to achieve victory? That's learning to play the game. Right. Right. You could know how the pieces move in chess and not be good at all. Oh, so we've played chess, haven't we? (laughs) Uh, We haven't. I have played chess in the past, but... No, I feel like you're, you know, know, I I feel kind of called out by that. (laughs) Orion's not bad. Orion is quite good at chess. We won't talk about the rest of us. I'm very bad at chess. I will fully admit that. Yeah, so I mean, I I wrote an article a few weeks ago on rule books because I got some really bad ones I was going through, and the thing to me is I know roughly how much a good rule book editor will charge, and it's a steal. <laughs> right? It's a steal for anyone in publishing or who's self-publishing their own design. Like those people know what they're doing. And you can see the difference when one of them has edited a, a rule book. And the fact that they aren't being put to more use is driving me insane. Yeah, and I'll put in a plug uh, for my friends over at Gaming Rules. They're fantastic. And um, reach out to them and get your game done with them. There are other rule book editors out there who I respect as well, but I really love those guys. So Gaming Rules, check them out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So please, people, write better rule books. <laughs> So just quickly, like a a note on the complexity, like there were a lot of fiddly bits in this game. I had fun, but really, I'm not sure that that more complex game uh, is the right uh, type of game for (laughs) these whimsical settings. I'm not really sure who that game is for, I guess. Yeah, that's a good point. Because you were commenting that it reminded you of Near and Far. And I certainly get that. But you know what it kind of reminded me of was Firefly. Absolutely. That was the other game that I thought of. Yeah. Because you're just kind of you're just kind wandering of, around. Yeah. And there's there's very little. And there, there's some player interaction. I imagine if we were playing with four or five players, it'd be a bit more intense. You mostly are hoping that the other players don't interact with you. Right. And, and then I you kind you of go around. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, it ended up working out in your favor. Yeah. Uh, well, and look, to some extent, you play the, the social setting that you're in also, right? So here I am, I'm you know, new to your group, I'm new to your home, I'm not going to walk up and punch you in the face, and <laughs> you all are apparently decent human beings who aren't going to chase me and drag me down kicking and screaming either. Um, so, so I played a strategy that was very much sort of, okay, how am I going to explore this game space without getting violent with anybody, even though... I chose the 4X game and said, let's play Empires of the Void 2. Right, right. I mean, I don't feel like I king-maked anything. You guys were within a couple points of each other. (laughs) So I was clearly losing the whole time. (laughs) But yeah, it it definitely reminded me of Firefly just with a lot more bits and little things to remember. And and just the the kind of almost like pseudo-sandbox feeling of, okay, I want to do this thing. There's nothing really stopping me from doing this thing. 
Yeah, I think um, for me the issue is that a good sandbox game lets you do a lot of different things, but each of them can matter a great deal. And there's value in specialization and you explore different paths. This was more like point salad to me than mm-hmm. real sandbox. Yep. It was because you know it didn't take very much investment in military to be able to walk around the board and beat up neutrals who are worth points and could get you stuff. And it didn't take a substantial investment in your you know uh, your movement track to free yourself up to be able to get where you wanted to go relatively quickly. So you know the various things that you needed to unlock to open those possibilities to you was easy. It was easy to do. Mm-hmm. So what did you do on your turn? Whatever was tactically presented to you on that turn. Right. Whatever you're, you know, if you got a card that you could accomplish one of the missions or something, you okay, let's do that. Yeah, and I would have complained more about the cards if I hadn't won, but since I did, I felt bad about it. <laughs> I thought I got terrible cards, and I was often looking at hands of cards where I literally couldn't use them at all. Like, they were all for a planet that didn't exist on the board because, you know, one planet was randomly left out or two or whatever it was. Or, you know, they, they were just impractical for me. Uh, on the other hand, um, Mac got some fantastic cards to let him fly around and shoot people and blow stuff up and, you know, yeah. do combat out of turn. And I was like, those are cool. I want more of those. I think the, I think the cards are so situational for the most part. They um, were mostly contingent on being... Most of the cards I saw, at least, were contingent on being at a a specific planet. I only saw a couple of those. I, yeah, oh, really? Honestly, I, th- yeah. I didn't see that many of those. I, I, I saw... It, the, the cards that I thought about using were mostly about dumping influence in a random place. Mm-hmm. And those were certainly nice. I used a couple of those to fairly good effect. And then I had a had like a, a really cool attack card that... Uh, two. I had two. So yeah, I guess I did stumble into a, a handful of cards. I mean, I only did that maybe three or four c- cards in the game, but... Well, they were important that's... because you grabbed influence that let you build the army that you built. Because the influence yeah. unlocked the allies, yep. and the allies yep. were the strong yeah. military. Yeah, influence was maybe even more important than I realized as I was playing. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah I, you, if, if you know you should back off of this because it felt like you were doing it all on purpose and had a really well designed strategy that synergized yeah but i now but, you're confessing to everyone that that was a total accident i was confident in what i was doing that's for sure but <laughs> but no i think i no and i think i think that's a fault of the game is i i mean i stumbled into something i was like okay a couple turns in i was like this is clearly a strategy that will at least progress me right and that's right. what i did and it was kind of fun and i played some cards that were kind of cool and referenced cool wars on other planets that were mechanically irrelevant but kind of cool yeah yeah and then this sort of story out there that and then at the end i was like okay isaac's got a completely different strategy and i can see that his points are kind of stored away in a different so i'm not sure who's going to come up on top and then we saw and and you won i it, it just kind of it was pleasant but it just kind of happened yeah yeah i agree with that one thing that I think really sets Empires of the Void apart from the other Locket games I've played, Above and Below and Near and Far, is that all of them don't have a ton of interplayer tension. They're all kind of... I mean, there's, there's interaction there, but they're all kind of about doing your own thing. The difference is that with Above and Below and Near and Far, you have the narrative and the story and the writing to make that part interesting... And the journey in Empires of the Void, you're kind of just grasping for that. You're grasping for some some narrative or flavor. And it's there a little bit, but you want more. And it makes the journey, I think, not nearly as interesting as those other two games. Because, you know, that's we've talked about this before, but there are some games that are interesting because they create this kind of rich narrative of battle and strategy and you know, a a battle of wits against the other players. And that's awesome. But there are other games that create that narrative just by being enjoyable to play. And I don't think Empires of the Void, at least on this first play, really hit either of those marks. So have any of you played Galactic Emperor? No. No. Okay. All right. Here we go. Okay, so Galactic Emperor is a game from, I don't know, 10 years ago, let's say. And it's got some real similarities here. It's a role selection game. And uh, some people will say it's a, it's sort of like a Puerto Rico light in space. 
Okay. Um, and it's got a lot of the same things that are going on here in the sense that you collect goods and you can trade goods for stuff and you can, uh, you know, get some techs and you can conquer planets and you can fight other players, but a lot of games end before any real fighting happens. Any, you know, there's not the big battle that determines the winner. Um, and it's fun and it's fine and it plays relatively quickly and it came and it went. Mm-hmm. And I think that Empires, Empires of the Void 2, when you ask who is it for, I think it's for two people. I think it's for, number one, people who want to play a game that feels big, but that really just takes an hour, hour and a half at most to play. I think once you know this game, it's an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's like that power plus hour game. Hmm? Plus, plus setup, right? There are 20 <laughs> setup steps. Yes. 20. <laughs> They're numbered. You know, so I think I think it does that, and I think it does that better than Galactic Emperor because there is a richer story, and there is better art, and there is there's something holographic about it. It feels bigger than it really is. The second person who I think will enjoy and should seek out and play Empires of the Void two is someone who wants to see Ryan Lauckett's development as a game designer, because I think that. Near and Far and Above and Below are better expressions of some of these same ideas, but Empires of the Void and, let's say, Empires of the Void 2, you can see where it came from. You can see the origins of a lot of these ideas. You can see the precursors of a lot of these ideas. And if that's how you explore and experience the hobby, if you're sort of, you know, following particular artists or tours, you know, trying to experience their development, Empires of the Void 2 is a great stop along the journey. Sure, yeah. I mean, mechanically, the what you see, kind of a locketism, is just various ways of using dice resolution that can be modified that he seems to really enjoy, and it's kind of that output randomness dice thing that isn't done frustratingly. It's done actually quite well. Uh, that I think is in all three games. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. I yeah, like that I, I hadn't put it in those terms, but I think that's really insightful. Well, let's let's move on to another topic since Orion especially didn't play with us. He was uh, he was busy working, but Isaac, I, w- I would like to know a bit more about your history with games. What got you into modern board games? I don't know that I've ever sort of not been into modern board games. So I mean, I'm I'm 41 years old, uh, which means that when I was a kid in the 80s, I was playing D and D. Mm-hmm. And I was playing Axis and Allies and uh, Conquest of the Empire and uh, Shogun, when it was still called Shogun, then it was Samurai Swords, then it was Akuza, then it was Samurai again, then it was Shogun again. I don't remember, but we played all those, <laughs> right? And, and we loved them. And um, so that was something that was a big part of my life and, and that I was always into. My brother introduced me to uh, somewhat more modern games when he, uh, when he played uh, Carcassonne. Um, mm-hmm. But I also remember, this is like, this is, for me, the greatest day of gaming history, the greatest weekend in gaming history. Uh, so it was 1996, and uh, it was, I think, January or February, and I was in college. And a friend of mine said, oh, hey, come with me. There's a game club that meets on Friday nights. Why don't you come and let's, you know, play some games? And I thought, all right, I'll, I'll check that out. And we went and I played this great game that everyone was talking about. And, you know, only a couple of people had managed to get copies in from Germany. It was called Settlers of Catan. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, you know, really, it was like nothing you'd ever played before. It was a whole different thing. It was completely eye-opening. It was eye-popping. I couldn't stop thinking about it all night. And then the next morning, that same friend came by and said, Oh, I got something else to show you and showed me Magic the Gathering. Oh man, <laughs> wow. you got the one-two punch, wow. right? And and so for me, it's sort of like that. There it is. There's modern gaming. I right. was inculcated, right? I was I was thrown in, um, and it was great, right? And I I was I was sold immediately. So um, I've always been a fan. I've always uh, uh, enjoyed them. I took sort of a, a relatively long break in my uh, in my mid twenties. I was in law school. I got married. Uh, you know, all these kinds of things. Uh, but when I was 30 years old and I had my, my first son, I decided I really like playing those games and I miss them and I want to do something that's not going to the bar and that's not watching sports. I still like going to bars. I still like watching sports. <laughs> but I wanted a hobby that felt, um, I don't know, a little bit more 
grown up. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I went on Meetup. And I found a group that played, you know, 15-minute drive from my house. And I went over there. And they were nice people. Not as nice as you, but really nice people. <laughs> and um, I still remember, I think my second game night there, we played Battlestar Galactica. Mm-hmm. Nice. And there was, like, this other guy who, it was his first time there, too. And he was he was nice, but clearly wasn't, like, super into games and was a little slow on the uptake. And so they had, in arranging the game, made sure that he wasn't the Cylon, right? But I didn't know that. (laughs) And I didn't know if, like, if he was just playing us all, right? So I used my, like, Cylon detector card on him, and he wasn't the Cylon. And everyone kind of looked at me and raised their eyebrows, and I was like, oh, I missed it. There was a thing here. Okay. (laughs) Uh, yeah, and since then, I've been playing games and eventually designing them. Yeah, so uh, you have, what, five published games, I think I saw? Uh, so around there? I don't know. Um, something in the, Somewhere between five and ten, there are quite a few that are published, in the that have been picked up and are in process and are not yet out on the market. Mm-hmm. Um, the ones that uh, folks mostly know me for are... Uh, Ravenous River, which was my first game published by anyone other than myself, which was an AEG game. Uh, Saikatsu, which uh, I did with my longtime collaborator, Matt Loomis, uh, and it has been our most successful game thus far. And Show and Tile, which just came out uh, at Gen Con uh, with Jellybean Games, uh, which is a kind of a Pictionary meets uh, Tangrams game. Uh, it's, a, it's a party game. Um, and so, yeah, we designed a lot of different styles and a lot of different genres. Uh, we have uh, a midway Euro game coming out from Arcane Wonders. Uh, oh, very Daimyo, nice. So, you know, that fills a different channel in mm-hmm. the games that we've been doing. We have a dexterity game with Mayday. So, yeah, so we're, we're, pretty, we're pretty eclectic in our uh, designs. Great. And Seikatsu is really the only one that, I mean, I have it. I reviewed it. Um, it's I'm only, looking at it. <laughs> yeah, the only one I'm, I'm really familiar of your designs, and I thought it was it's really fantastic, wonderful little super easy to teach it ended up being my mom's favorite game i think of all the games i've showed her and she asked me for a copy for christmas so thanks for making a nice game (laughs) (laughs) thank you thank you for for the support it's a it's a really fun game and i you know uh we didn't know how well it was going to be received because it's a three-player abstract right and sure that feels like an odd duck a little bit but we've really just been delighted by the reception it's gotten. People, you know, the community has embraced it, and it's been published here and in Germany in three languages, and in Poland and in Korea. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, just this modest little game that we kind of knew had some magic to it. Like you played it that first time, even before we figured it all out, and it just felt nice. Yeah, I mean, the visual design of it, I think, helps a, a whole lot. It's just really, really nice to look at. Was was that part of the design process of, oh, we really want it to look a certain way? Or did mm-hmm. you kind of hand that off to the publisher to do? Uh, well, I'll tell you that the initial prototype uh, did not look quite as nice as uh, the game that uh, you got in your hands. But it was done on poker chips, and the feel of that was was part of it from the very beginning. Oh, so yeah. The, mm-hmm. the feel yeah. of those chips in your hand really mattered. But the I mean, sound they make. Yeah, yeah, well, we got a great plastic. I mean, that was one of the things that took a while in the production was figuring out what to use. It, it's actually, um, the plastic is the same plastic that's used in, like, traditional white dice. Mm-hmm. It's called urea plastic. And if you clink it together in your hands, you'll hear it. You'll hear yeah. it. It feels like you're rolling dice. We the initial prototype was I mean it was janky like all initial prototypes are so sure it was poker chips that we had pasted <laughs> on um, binder rings to you know like binder reinforcement stickers oh sure yeah and so the color of the poker chip was the flower and then the color of the binder ring was the bird and that's that's how the game was done originally at what point did that flower and bird theme come in i mean it could have been anything it could have been ships and planets right from the start right from the start yeah. even when it was poker chips with the thing it was birds and flowers and it was a garden and it was called yeah. saikatsu that was that works so well it from the beginning and uh, never changed uh, at a certain point actually almost but right before we hit print i said are we sure we want to call this saikatsu like that's a weird name maybe and the publisher was like no we're going with it and and so we did 
It's a nice sounding word. It, it, it is a nice sounding People word. People are familiar with katsu, although it has <laughs> nothing to do with breaded uh, no, no, I cutlets. Mean, so <laughs> uh, the irony is, so sakatsu means life or way of life, but it could possibly also mean like chores, like the things you have to do in your life. And so that was weird. I remember when you know a, a Japanese speaker said, why did you name your game chores? <laughs> Uh, you know, but uh, um, a lot of games are really about just doing chores as, as well. Better, it's true. You better really than in the end. Else. In yeah. the end, all games are recreational chores. It's <laughs> a good way of putting it. Uh, yeah, but I, I think when we were choosing who to publish with, we were lucky enough with Saikatsu that we had a few publishers that were interested, and we were kind of weighing our options. Um, one of the questions that we asked every publisher who was interested is. What's your vision for the game for the production? And there were publishers whose vision was to um, go as mass as possible with the game, right? To cardboard tokens and try and sell it for 20 or 25 dollars. We ultimately decided to go with a publisher that shared our vision for the game, which was simple and beautiful, and the game should make you feel as good as sort of the the, the roots that it's coming from, the you know creating of a Zen garden. And, and I think that, um, you know, IDW did a phenomenal job on the production. Peter Walken, who uh, did the art, did a great job, both as an illustrator and as a graphic designer. And there's a lot of light touches there that you don't notice, but that make a difference. Things like the, the tokens are inscribed on the back, like, mm-hmm. so they're etched with the Saikatsu uh, pictograms, so that when you draw a token out of the bag you can feel which side is the side you're supposed to hide, right? Little things like that that really just make a difference. And we didn't come up with that. You know, the publisher gets full marks. But yeah, we were really, really lucky and really, really proud. And the nice thing is that, you know, MSRP on the game, uh, you know, $39.95, which is definitely a a bit of a higher price point for for a beautiful abstract. Mm -hmm. But it being out on the market for a while, if you're interested in the game, a lot of folks can find it, you know, at a more... $28, $29 $28, $29 kind of price. Uh, and I think that's really helped. I think a lot of people are willing to get into it at that price. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're excited. There's another printing coming. And just, it's it's been it's been wonderful to hear. A lot of people play it with parents, with grandparents. Um, I mean, I, I had a heartbreaking story about, you know, a guy who was playing it with his dad in hospice, you know. And, like, mm. it's nice to know that your games are getting out to those kinds of places and having that kind of impact. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's it's also one of the best ways to introduce new gamers to the delight of triangle numbers, <laughs> <laughs> which which never failed to be a good choice <laughs> in yeah. scoring. I I, I really want to like name our design studio triangular scoring games. You know, we use it so much. It's such a good sequence. And something I, I blogged about a little, actually, because... So I do a blog at uh, kindfortress.com, and mostly what I write about there is um, different topics in game design. So uh, I, I took apart sequences and scoring, you know, triangular scoring and, and geometric and so forth, and tried to explain when different ones were useful to incentivize different kinds of behaviors or which types of games or, or types of, you know, scoring opportunities should use which scale. Mm-hmm. And and triangular just it works super well. <laughs> it works super <laughs> super well because it incentivizes specialization, right? Because you go up. So triangular a triangular mm-hmm. sequence, uh, common one you might be familiar with one three six ten fifteen twenty one. And the thing to know about it is that the gap between the number you're on and the next number is always going to be one greater than the gap before it. So. You're going from 0 to 1, that's a difference of 1. You're going from 1 to 3, it's a difference of 2. You're going from 3 to 6, that's a difference of 3. That sequence encourages specialization without becoming too runaway, without making specialization the only thing that's worthwhile. Yeah, Yeah. in in their cases where the the exponent or x squared Mm -hmm. is appropriate, I, I think of like Seven Wonders where you're encouraging more of the preventative. Um, so it's okay to kind of let it run away because you're, you're incentivizing other players to, 
to, to, to hate draft, right? To hate keep draft. you yeah. from getting the fifth or sixth yeah. or seventh member of the set. Yeah. Right. It, but, it creates a key point of interaction in that game. But that gets carried away real fast. So you better have a good reason, I suppose. Yeah. It, well, well, triangle's was, just a nice gentle, yeah. it's such a gentle curve. It, it, yeah, it seems to do it right. I mean, in Seven Wonders, it's interesting you bring it up. Seven Wonders, most of the time, you do better by collecting the diversity sets rather than the specialization sets. Right. Because they provided for that. They give you a seven-point bonus. So if you get one of each, it's ten points. If you get three cards that are the same, it's nine points. Right? Right. So for the same three cards, you get more bang for your buck not specializing. And the fact that that's true means that I can prevent three players from specializing in any one of those symbols by just taking the diverse set. Mm -hmm. And that's how Seven Wonders self-balances against the runaway. Because if you get seven of the same kind in Seven Wonders, congratulations, you have won Seven Wonders. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, I think I've seen five before, and it it wasn't even close. Yeah, you know, there's another game that does an interesting thing with the sequence, which is Cacao, Phil Walker Harding game about, uh, I guess, Cocoa Bean. Um, you know Cacao? No, 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 no we no. haven't played it. Okay, so in Cacao, Cacao is a great game, fascinating design. But basically, there's something that you can collect. It's water that you can collect that initially rises up sharply. I don't remember the exact sequence, but it might be it might be triangular, it might even be exponential. But then somewhere around the fifth or sixth uh, member of the set, it flattens. So mm. let's say it's one, three, six, ten. 12, 14, 16, 21, 27, right? So oh, it, it interesting. Curves back around. So it's sort of like the graph of X cubed, right? It kind of mm. sharp, then flat, then sharp again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you're incentivized strongly to specialize because the top of that, you know, just the end of that curve is real, real good. But if you don't get there, it's punishing, you know, because you've wasted a lot of actions but there's also a good jumping off point right so everyone wants to get the first three and then you sort of decide it's almost a push your luck decision right am i going to try and yeah. get the next six yeah brass which we've been playing quite a bit recently has somewhat similar progressions with its victory points i know some of them are fairly linear they go up in victory points like i know was the, the iron i think goes up in points and down yep. in income pretty linearly, but some of them seem to move around in, in interesting ways. Especially in the Birmingham, uh, there's a couple tracks that really oscillate in terms of value and bang for your buck. and things like Oh that. yeah, there's the one that's quite long, and it, it tends to jump around. Or it does almost a ratchet thing, where it'll go up and then jump down for like, you know, it'll go up to like seven points for one building, and the next one will be two, and then three, and then it'll start rising again. And then just which I is think super interesting. The, the pottery building, which is like one building costs twenty first, you know, stuff you want, and then the next building costs zero and gives you nothing. Oh and it's just yeah, like this blocker building you have to just deal with. It's uh, like a dummy building. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of interesting things in brass that skew the calculation, but yeah, triangle numbers are very nice. I think. When was the first time I really noticed them? I might have been Dominant Species. That which, was the one I thought of. I'm which sure uses them very well. There must be other ones. Well, Ticket to Ride but, has a very close to triangular number sequence. Oh, that's true, yeah. It's not exact, but it's very close. And uh, Alan Moon, um, uh, when asked about it, said he did what felt right. He didn't, he didn't sort of model it on triangular. Um, but this is just what felt right for the game. Ended up being very close. Very yeah. close. I think it's off in one term, maybe two terms, and it's off by one on those. It's like, what is it? It's like one, three, seven, ten, fifteen. I think. I think it's just the six becomes a seven. Yeah, it's been a while since I've played yeah. Ticket to Ride, but I remember that now. Yeah. So besides designing games, you are also working on a project to classify game mechanisms i guess is that the is that a good way of putting it i I think it's or catalog maybe yeah i I think that's right i mean it's part of a bigger project that i feel like i'm a part of rather than that i'm an owner of which is uh, the project for game designers to develop a better vocabulary a better language for talking about game design i think any art form goes through sort of waves of formalism and informalism 
And we're definitely in that stage where we need a bit more formalism, where we need a bit more language and a bit more ways to share common practices and ways to talk about uh, approaches. One of the examples I always bring up is, uh, you know, Matt and I, you know, my co-designer, having worked together for a few years, have some shorthand that we're used to talking about. So, uh, for example, we use the language of a ticket as a, something in a game, which means achieve this thing, get points, right? Cash in this set of things, four points. We just call all those tickets. Some people call them contracts, right? Another way to uh, think of the same idea. Mm -hmm. um, it's useful to capture that and say, oh, what do you think we should do here for score? And do you want to do tickets? Right? No, I don't want to do tickets. Let's do a, let's do a declining point race. Declining point race? What the heck's that? Oh, you know, like uh, in Lanterns, the first person gets nine and then you take the top off the stack and the next person gets eight and then seven and then six. Um, right? We come up with some of these language or, mm -hmm. um, or you know, I really like this game, but I'm trying to solve the, 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 the fourth player problem. What's the fourth player problem? Well, it's in a drafting game usually, uh, especially like action draft and like worker placement. The first two or three things are awesome to do, and then the fourth one is not quite as awesome. And the fourth player does what? Right? So if you play Stone Age, you know, you, you take right. the fields or the boom boom hut, and then what does the third player do? Right? That player is, is sort of at the drop-off point. And if a game doesn't take care of that, yeah. it, you know, it doesn't feel good. So having a name for that is really great. Instead yeah. of saying, hey, you know that thing in Stone Age? So I want to create more language for games. And, and I'm not alone in, you know, in this project at all. And uh, frankly, if you're alone in a project about creating language. It's doomed <laughs> to failure. <laughs> <laughs> that has never worked. Yeah. So I really, uh, I've found myself a part of a few different efforts to, to talk about this stuff. I, I can't say that any of it has been especially formal over time, what I started doing was I started writing on my blog this series called Patterns in Game Design. And so the idea here was uh, I wasn't specifically talking about mechanisms and saying, here's all the mechanisms, as much as I was talking about underlying patterns that could be expressed in mechanisms, right? So triangular uh, scoring was one of those underlying patterns. It was ways in which designers incentivize certain actions, specializing in certain actions, and, and how you use different scales of change in order to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, patterns in game design. Another one that I liked was um, forcing lines. So there are games where, you know, uh, Orion's the chess player. So like, right, you make a move and that sets up a variety of other moves that you know are going to happen. You know if I move here, he's going to take me back and then I'm going to take him back and then he's going to take me back and I'm going to wind up with the pawn on, e on e6. I want that pawn on e6, let's do it, right? Games that have forcing lines, that's a pattern that you could instill into a game as a designer, that you can create in a game as a designer. And when you do that, you're going to create a thinky game because I have to start thinking four, five, six moves ahead. It's a strategic game rather than a tactical game. So those are some of the ideas I was trying to collect up. And I made like a list of like 50 different patterns, you know, things like everything I do is good for you too. That's a pattern, right? I take something, but everyone gets something too. You know, role selection is an example of that. I take this action, but everyone yeah. else gets to follow. Everything I do is good for you too. Did you call that the council room? <laughs> I did not call that the council room. Or everybody wins. <laughs> everybody wins. Yeah. So, you know, I, I really, I just, I made a list of 50 some out of them. And I figured I'd do one a week, which I kept up for a little while. And then... <laughs> I was invited on to uh, Ludology, the best game design podcast uh, around, um, mm -hmm. and to talk about it. And after doing so, Jeff Engelstein reached out to me and said, I have this idea for a book, and I'm wondering if you'd be interested in joining and helping me write it. Um, and that book is an encyclopedia of game mechanisms. So it's a little more granular than mm -hmm. the Patterns book which I don't know, it's not a book yet. It's a blog, but maybe one day. Sure. Um, but it's more granular, but it's also in some ways been exciting because there isn't really a mechanism. Every mechanism is a family. You know, what is worker placement? Well, you know, you put a guy in a building and you get an action. Okay, well, then there's the variation of, well, but it doesn't really block any anyone else from taking it. It just makes it cost more or they have to put two workers or there's a master worker who can replace the worker. Or you can do it and get the action, but the last worker won't get anything because the, yeah. the stock will run. Like there's so many variants on that core idea 
of action drafting represented on a board with a token, well, right? That, that, that doesn't even get into, like, Tokaido. Right. Well, then that's <laughs> Which the... seems like its own thing, but is kind <laughs> of worker placement. Yeah, or like or Spirium, uh, where you're placing workers in between two buildings, so you might mm-hmm. use either one of them, or you might just lift the worker up and gain money for all the other people who have placed workers around those same buildings. <laughs> you know, which is really more of an auction than a draft. And then you get into the whole, what is an auction and what is a draft? Auctions use currency to create priority. Drafts use turn order to create priority. But mathematically, they're yeah. mathematically they're both a kind of auction. And then you get into the world of, oh, God, everything is an auction, isn't it? Oh, so, man. So I that- remember there was some discussion on Twitter about trick-taking games. And then someone was like, a trick-taking game is just a one-round auction with cards. Yeah. And I was like, oh. <laughs> oh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so, so Shannon Applecline is the um, uh, the guy who is most associated with this notion that every game is an auction. And you know, if you go check out Shannon Applecline and the uh, uh, the was it uh, the Grand Unified Auction Theory of Gaming, something like that, <laughs> he will describe it. And he talks about uh, rock paper scissors as an auction game. Right, it's a it is an auction game, you know, single bid reveal auction game with a non monotonic currency. Right, in other words, non monotonic meaning that one currency might beat another currency sometimes, but be beaten by another. Right, Which, sure. You know, does it help to like what what are we doing when we say that? Right, is that a helpful way to think about things? No. What does it give you? Right, what yeah. does that teach you? So I think it teaches you some things. One thing it teaches you is that deeply embedded in nearly every kind of game is resources become converted into some kind of gain. I'm converting a resource into some other type of advantage. And allocation of those advantages through some rule-based system is what a lot of games are about. And it's certainly true for many economic games. And if you like, think about like a lot of Spiel DR games, they sort of follow this thing of interesting allocation of resources mechanism interesting conversion mechanism leads to victory points right but 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 emotep what do you want to do on your turn you want to get stones you can get stones that's good do you want to place stones into one of three games that turns those stone into points those are the two things you can do on your turn that's it right get the resource put some claim on victory points using the resource so it is useful to think about games like that by the way true of chess also you're converting certain advantages time and positioning, right? So it's hard to say that that's really yeah. an auction, <laughs> but that general framework is helpful. On the other hand, it's also just a fun game to be like, how can I describe this game as an auction? Yeah. So, so do you find it useful, or uh, yeah, do you find it useful to to try to define like some some kind of like Platonic I- ideal of like worker placement? Like mm-hmm. we all talk about worker placement. Mm-hmm. Is it useful to to, to try to like? grasp at what exactly that is or are you always just kind of talking about this collection of 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 things that we know are worker placement but there's no kind of like form there (laughs) right well i I think it i think it is both fun and useful although often when it's most fun it's least useful (laughs) in other words (laughs) It's it's fun to like take ideas and and stretch them as far as they'll go, and it's fun to try and take an absurd premise and and make it work. Um, yeah. But that's not super useful. What is useful, I think, is um, de- well, I'll say it this way. You know, I think um, I think I think it's Socrates who said geometry isn't true; it's useful. Right, which is to say that when we're defining things in geometry, we're not defining them because there is a true circle or a true triangle or whatever. It's because it's really useful to imagine that there is, and reality is close enough to it that it makes it useful. I think that's true of doing this with game design mechanisms because we need to talk about them. And I want to say worker placement and have it mean similar things. Today, if you go out into the general hobby gaming public. So the general hobby gaming public, to be clear, has never heard of Board Game Geek. They're probably not even on Reddit. They don't go to conventions. But they do play some games, and they have like five or six of them in their house, and they like them. They think they're great. And if you say to them, do you want to play a worker placement game? They'll probably say, a what? 
But if they've heard of a worker placement game, what they think it means is, generally speaking, a Euro game, a game without dice, right? Even if it has no workers in it. You'll often hear people talk about a game like Orléans as a worker placement game. In my opinion, Orléans has nothing to do with worker placement. Why? Because worker placement, for me, my definition, is it's got to involve a draft. It's got to involve the taking away of options from another player based on my choice. And Orléans doesn't have that. Or Leon, you're pulling workers out of a bag and putting them on your own board, and you know, you're taking choices away from other players in terms of scoring, but not in terms of the actions they can take. It is helpful when you're talking to a design, you know, talking to another designer to be able to know what we both agree a worker placement game is. So that's useful. Mm -hmm. I think it's also useful if you're trying to learn about design, whether to be a designer because you just are jazzed by this stuff or because you like talking about this stuff, it's useful to think about. Look at all these varieties of worker placement games. What's the through lines? What's common about them? How are designers subverting them in some ways? You know, one of the things that I thought was fascinating about Euphoria, Jamie Stegmaier's one of his early games, is it had this bumping mechanism. So I would choose an action, and then you could come in, and you could also choose that action. By doing so, you would bump my dice, which are my workers, mm -hmm. off, which, generally speaking, was great for me. Because you had to recall workers. You had to use an action to bring workers back home. So I wasn't blocking the space by claiming it. But if I claimed a space that I knew you would need to, I was creating efficiency for myself. Right, yeah. The gallerist does that very well also. Well, right. Although I don't think the gallerist is a worker placement game. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, so I, I, I... Because it doesn't have any blocking at all? Right. It's a okay. one worker worker placement game. And... It, without any blocking. Kanban is, to my mind, a worker placement game um, because it does have real blocking. Mm -hmm. um, but the gallerist, when... And we just actually had a Twitter thread about this. If folks are interested, you should look it up. It was me and, and um, I think uh, Seth Jaffe went back and forth about this quite a bit. In the gallerist, when I place my worker, I have to decide if I want to invest this additional... I forget what they call it, but some additional associate... Assistant. The assistant, right? Mm -hmm. If I invest the assistant as well, then when somebody else claims this and bumps me, I get to take some action with that assistant. And to me, that is not drafting and it's not blocking. It's investing. I'm, I'm spending more resources. I'm gambling that you're going to want this space too. And if you do, I get a payout. That to me is distinct from worker placement now we can argue about it we can talk about yes or no but, that's fair but being yeah. able to articulate yeah. that difference yes. only comes about because we have a baseline of worker placement means this and so yeah so i like precision because it generates um the possibility of a good conversation where we're focused on what we're disagreeing about yeah and it's actually something i find super interesting about language is that People often fall into either 100% prescriptivism where they're saying, oh, no, words actually mean certain things, or the exact opposite, where it's the words only mean something in context. Yeah. And to me, I think it's pretty much impossible to, to use the prescriptivist thing. Like, that's just simply not true. That's not how language evolves or works. However... There's the separate argument where you say, if we use, if we decide as a community, as people to use certain words in certain ways, it's just nicer. <laughs> like it, it provides utility. Right. Well, computer languages are prescriptivist, right? They, oh, they right, only yeah. mean what they mean. They sure. don't mean anything else. And, uh, you know, that's yeah. a product you of... You can open up the interpreter, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's the product of ultimately a very, uh, uh, not a very, it's just a binary processor, right? At yeah. the end of the day, either this is going to happen or this is not going to happen. And the entire system is constructed around yes or no answers to each question. It shows you the power of prescriptivism, right? It's not that prescriptivism is non-expressive. It's exceptionally expressive. You just got to be really good at talking it. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I I think that any profession or you know any you, you need a technical language um, once you're getting into you know any kind of craft, and I don't mean to take away anyone's right to talk about games any way they want. Like that's not the goal of this. The goal of this is not to create the official language of gaming. Right. The goal of this is to help working designers communicate more effectively, yeah. and I think most importantly to help teach new designers. Because the biggest challenge that I think we have 
in bringing new designers through the process is there's no educational system that's set up here. There's no real great mentoring process. It's really tough for expert designers to transmit to a next generation what they've learned. If you don't have a language to express these concepts, then it's up to the, the new designer to kind of just kind of learn um, from playing the games themselves or, or stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It, you know, if you don't have a language, then you learn from experience. Yeah. And which, which is fine and great. And But that's a massive workload but, when it comes to games, yeah, right? Um, right. Right. At a certain point, we played enough games, we should be able to shorthand this. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I think also that we begin to discover that our assumptions about why something happens may not be correct or or that maybe each of us has different assumptions. So the alpha player problem, co-op games and the problem of a single player dominating the play experience, right? Designers are arguing over why that occurs, whether it's a design problem Um, Is it a group problem? Like, what causes this? What are the methods for dealing with it? And I think that what we've discovered is that people have really different opinions about how to address this. So there are the designers who say, I want to prevent this from happening because I think this is a bad experience. So let's play Hanabi or Fuse, right? Hanabi, you have communication limits. Fuse, you have time limits. You couldn't possibly alpha either of those games then you've got uh designers who say i don't really care that this happens frankly i think it's terrific and if you are playing with a jerk then it doesn't matter whether you're playing a co-op or a non-co-op you're playing with a jerk and that's and jerks are alphas you know like in sort of the the problem is the player the, the player or the group and not the game itself you know and so they lean into everything is open and solve it together and robinson crusoe you know the most interesting thing I've heard on this recently is the idea that this is actually a... a the, the challenge here is players have disagreed about what fun they're trying to have. Sort of it's a magic circle issue, <laughs> right? And we know that, you know, in semi-co-ops we have that, right? I If I don't agree with you as to whether a group loss is better or worse than a group win and an individual loss, we're going to have a bad time. Right, because if I think the group loss, you know, is horrible, and you think it's just as bad and doesn't matter, you know, individual loss is just as bad, then I'm going to sabotage the game, and you're going to be pissed off. Right. The same is true of a co-op. I think you can extend it to there and say the problem is what did we agree? What fun did we agree we were going to have? The fun of all of us trying to solve this together, and even if you think you have the best idea, you're going to make space for other people. Or are we trying to have the fun of we're going to win, right? And those two things, you know, are, are, are a difference in opinion about how to make this game fun. So as a designer, that's a different challenge. So, so just having mm-hmm. the words alpha player problem yeah. created this really rich conversation. Yeah, which, which is fantastic. I mean, when you learn about communication and how to express complicated or even you know, not even necessarily complicated ideas to other people. Uh, one of the th- main things I've learned is using what's called schemas, right? You want to use language that creates an image in someone's mind. That's always going to be more evocative and more communicative than describing that thing kind of scientifically, I suppose, or uh, step by step, you want to use comparisons and analogies and images. And when you have a more precise kind of understanding of game design mechanisms and genres and, and, and aspects of games, you're able to do that. Because when you say worker placement, right, I picture Agricola in my mind, mm-hmm. right? And so I know, okay, that's my prototypical worker placement game, and I can kind of deduce roughly where the edges of that are going to be. And then we can immediately cut to the interesting conversation. Right. Right. It skips over the boring, dumb part of that conversation. (laughs) Right. Or at least the part that we already had. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. And it helps us get to the next place. I I love even just your example of your shorthand earlier of a, a ticket. Like that's not something that I had a shorthand up until this point, but it'll be so much easier for me to have a conversation about, you know, just something that I'm going to just, what, convert to victory points, basically. Yeah. Kind of like one step short of the end game. Mm-hmm. That's that's so, I, now I can compare two different games' ticket systems. 
Right. That's not something that I would have done before because of the barrier to entry. And because um, of some of the ways that they're disguised. You know, because there are tickets yeah. like in Ticket to Ride, right? I'm going to connect these routes and then I qualify for this thing. You know, but that's different from the tickets of pay these three goods and then score this, you know, these victory points. You, you don't necessarily think of those as the same because one is disguised as a route building game and the other is disguised as essentially a set collection game. And so you don't naturally realize that those are both tickets, right? Those are both, here's your reward for completing this set of things before somebody else and turning it in. You know, it's, you also get into, I think, things like definitions. So not mechanisms exactly, but just definitions. So for example, what is currency, right? So, you know, it feels like we all know what currency is, but wait a minute, what does it mean in a game that you have currency? And so one of the things that, I, you know, I look out for when I think about when I, when I design games or when I play prototypes is if you can only spend the money on one thing, it's not a currency. And then you got to ask yourself, why is this even in the game? Why do I need to earn this thing to turn it into that thing when it doesn't turn into anything else? There's no decision to be made. So you're just making me engage in this process. Why? A currency has to be able to be converted into at least two things, and I have to make a decision. And the other thing is that usually uh, we get into, this is another term that I've made up, and I've started making a list of these, and maybe, maybe that's okay. useful at some point, but the notion of a terminal resource, right? Because a currency is a kind of resource. It's a resource that, sure. you know, the technical word is it's fungible. It can be exchanged for many things. But a terminal resource is something that you can't go backwards. Once you've converted it to something, you can't go backwards. And in a sense, victory points are yeah. a special case of terminal resource. They can only be used for one thing, winning, right? That's what they're there for. But that's a really helpful framework all of a sudden. Yeah. You've got thing, you've got resources, you've got currencies, because currencies can be exchanged into multiple resources, and you've got terminal resources that can't go backwards. Within that, you have victory points. Now you can analyze a lot of different games and see how it's playing with the options that the designer is giving you in your market, right? In the different market mechanisms that exist. So that's another area of language that I'm playing with is trying to define stuff. And I know that people won't agree to all these definitions. And again, that's not the point, but it's nice to be able to say them, right? And somebody may say, I don't see the why this is a currency and that's not a currency. I think, you know, this or that. And that's fine. But we don't have any of that almost, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the project I'm involved in and, you know, doing it through the blog, doing it through the book, doing it through these conversations. It's actually, I think, the thing I'm enjoying most about the gaming hobby right now is that, that work, that conversation. That's wonderful. I mean, I remember in some research I was doing a couple months ago, I read an article from Greg Kostikian. Yep. I can't remember exactly the name. It was like, I have no language and I must... I have no words, so I must design. Yeah, yeah, I have no words and I must design. Yeah, must, right, yeah. 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 And that's, what, 15 years old by this point? It's a fairly yeah. fairly old article, and it was wonderful. But even then, it's amazing to see... You know, he's making a good point, the same kind of point. Like, we don't have the language of even, like, what a game is. And there's been progress made on, on that. But even... In that article, he talks about how co-op games just aren't games. Mm -hmm. And he could not foresee in the board gaming space what a co-op game would look like, which I found remarkable. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, he's just an incredibly smart person. And, one, you know, from what I can tell, one of the most influential writers on games uh, of the last couple decades. And it was something he just missed and it, we we've since developed a way to create co-op games that would fit within the parameters of how he defined a game yeah and the the conversation about what is a game it, it's one of those it's a really great conversation to have except with anyone who wants to have it <laughs> because so often the people who want to have it are judging are diminishing are saying that's not a game because i don't like it or because it doesn't do the things that I think games are valuable for doing. And I'm totally disinterested in that. Like that's one of the least important things to to define, I feel like. Well, it, it's a power grab. I want to define it because I want to own and control this. 
And that's never why I want to define something. I want to define things because I, I, they are more useful to me once I feel like I understand them. And definition is part for me of understanding. James Ernest, uh, cheap ass games. James Ernest, one of the Ur designers, right? Um, really, really, uh, guy. I, I have tremendous, tremendous respect for. Has an incredible definition of games. You know what games are? They're things that are sold in game stores. <laughs> <laughs> or they're on a shelf next to other games, right? And then, you know, obviously it's a circular definition, and you know, but he's making a point, which is, you know, so you'll you'll challenge him, you'll be like, oh, so so jigsaw puzzles are games? He's like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> you know, and you're like, well, but aren't they distinct in some way from I don't know, Ticket to Ride? Yeah, they are distinct in some way, but not in the way of not being games. <laughs> you know, you can list these distinctions but why are you saying it's not a game because you're being a jerk stop being a jerk right? oh man and even you know outside of the topic of board games it's something i see every single day where just perusing social media and horrible political discussions and when you slip into the comments on some article and remember why you don't do that and half the time it's someone just trying to define themselves into their argument or out of their opponent's argument. And it's like, isn't, you know, isn't X, Y, and the correct answer is, well, depends on how you define it. Right, right. Like, and, and, and that's, so the depends on how you define it is 100% correct. But what I found to be a little more effective is to say, let's stipulate that how you define this word is exactly how you meant it. Let's also stipulate that there's some other word that defines the distinction I'm getting at. Yes. And that's the word I want to talk about. Can we talk about that word? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, I don't, I, I've done that before in conversation. It's like, I mean this thing and I d- describe it. I'm like, what do you want to call that? Right. Yeah. Just it, give me a word. I'll, I'll use that word. I don't care what word it is. Even when we're talking about some topic in games where we're trying to figure out what our fundamental difference in opinion is. Like, we don't have the words necessarily to make it distinct. So, so like, often we'll, we'll, we'll start a, a sentence with, well, if we take game to mean this, then this and this and this. If we take it to mean this, this and this. this. The point is understanding. The, right. The, the I point, mean, the we've had is, entire discussions of just trying to understand how we were using a specific yeah. word. I'm remembering the... Uh, discussion about chaos yeah because you because you <laughs> guys understand discussion about chaos no i think it's super interesting because you guys <laughs> was, understand chaos as this kind of mathematical property which i had just learned about because i didn't study math and it's still very difficult for me to wrap my mind around chaos and how it's distinct from yeah. other things right no so but had, that entire discussion long... was just trying to yeah, get that it, understanding there were long parts of that conversation where one of us was just giving the other person's definition for chaos for this or like th- test cases in order for us to to be able to talk about it and then and then we revert to the other person's definition I don't know. again the, the purpose is under, understanding and like you said the the absolute worst argument is the kind of argument that isn't about understanding it's about i have my hill to, to stand on and i want to shut someone else's mm-hmm. you know off of that Right, but but we have to acknowledge that definitions do end up being meaningful because they control stuff. So, for example, yeah, let's say you know libraries are now really quite different from what they were when I was growing up, and um, books are you know one small part of what they do. It's sort of like uh, you know the phone is this little used app on my phone, right? <laughs> right? There's you know all kinds of things, and and games are are something that are exploding in libraries. And now ask yourself, what happens if that definition of what is a game starts controlling what the libraries can buy? We, by the way, deal with this all the time in, in shipping, right? There is a, um, uh, a shipping rate through the post office for what's called media mail. Yeah. Media mail is intended for books and magazines and things like that. You know what it's not intended for? Board games. <laughs> Why not? Why aren't board games media? In what sense is the cardboard that has been constructed into a board game different from the cardboard that has been constructed into a book? But at some point, a definition was, you know, made, and everyone's sort of gone with it. Now, ask yourself this. I can take a 
choose your own adventure book and send it media mail, right? Is that a game? <laughs> right? Let's push it further. Let's say it's one of those choose your own adventure books that comes with like a pencil because there's like some stats to keep. Is that a game? Can I send that media mail? Right? And you can continue to play with this and push it. What if it's on a whiteboard? But if that's I- but that's not the interesting discussion. The interesting discussion, the actual question is are board games a kind of thing that ought to be classified differently? It's not the word that matters. Right. It's the principle. And that's the uncomfortable discussion that people don't want to have. Right. Or, you know, and this is this goes back, the reasonable people don't want to have it. The unreasonable people relish having it. <laughs> yeah. Right? All yeah. they want to do <laughs> is take away your right to enjoy what you're enjoying because it doesn't match the boxes they have drawn and decided are the only boxes that may exist. So I, I, I struggle with it because I really enjoy these conversations with designers who recognize what they are, their explorations, right? Their yeah. attempts, you know, so so uh, I grew up in a very traditional uh, Jewish household and I have spent many, many hours studying the Talmud. The Talmud is all about really, really sharp arguments, right? Two sides who take radically different positions and then kind of explore them in the same way of somebody saying the mind isn't a game and somebody else saying the mind is a game. Why is the mind a game? Well, you know, and they'll give you some argument. The other one will say, well, no, I think the mind is not a game because, and they're analogizing from, you know, first principles, trying to establish a rubric or, or, or a schema for what is and isn't a game. Now, at the end of the day, I think that if what you're doing with it is called playing, then the thing that you're doing it to is a game. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't need to get more than that. And, you know, oh, well, what? maybe if it's a toy. Okay, it's a toy. Fine. Memoir 44 is a toy. Look at all those pieces. It's toy-like. It's fine. <laughs> my, my kids, by the way, their favorite game is Ticket to War. <laughs> right? It involves Ticket to Ride and Memoir 44 pieces moving in coordination. <laughs> And it's great, you know, so 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 I'm not caught up in, in the purity conversation. But I do find it useful to say that as much as I enjoy the mind and think that it creates these really cool experiences, I think it might just be a Skinner box and not a game. Even though it is exceptionally game-like and I feel like I'm doing game-ish things and it comes in a gamular box, you know, but it maybe is just a Skinner box in the sense that I don't really know if that moment that happens when we're right in sync and I played the 94 and then you played the 95 and then we both paused and I played the 97 and you're the 98. I don't know if that moment was us mind reading. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure it was. It feels like it was, but I don't, because just as often it doesn't go that way and we bomb and we're like, oh, I should have known that. I don't know that you should have known. We may just be rolling a D6 and celebrating when we get, you know, a three and under and crying when we get a four and over. I, I really don't know. It, so, but I love that it exists right in that space where I don't know because it tells me there is no hard line and it lands right in the gray area that is unknowable and undefinable. And that is an artistic statement to me. That is a game getting past being a game and being a work of art. I will not have any comments. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't dislike the mind. I think it's all right. I don't dislike the mind. Mm. He doesn't like the mind. I think <laughs> I've never I, actually played I think, it. I played it a few times. Uh, okay. Not with you, but I think I gave it a six. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was enjoy. To me, it was just like it was just Hanabi all over again. Oh, I love Hanabi. We don't. Uh, uh, there's not a podcast I get on where I don't talk about Hanabi. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> No, we can spare the audience. I believe <laughs> I, I've written I about believe, this on the website. <laughs> I believe, for the sake of understanding, I took the position that Hanabi was not a game. On the I think Hana- no, I, th- I think Hanabi in the mind is as much a game as any other pure co-op game. So I think that the experience of uh, I, I think it's unfair to call both Hanabi and the mind one game. The, there, there are so many different ways to take the rules of Hanabi mm-hmm. such that they're not the same game. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, there's the people who are playing in hermetically sealed rooms with zero communication whatsoever. And it is entirely a deduction and almost like an iterated prisoner's dilemma kind of a game. Like you, you sure. learn how people think based on playing it over and over again. And then, you know, the way that my friends and I play is... Um, 
you're allowed to do the communication that it says in the book. You're also allowed to do one other thing, which is you are allowed to ask, what do I know about my hand? Mm. Because we don't play Hanabi as a memory game. We're not interested in memorizing the cards. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, and and we have certain conventions that we've developed over time, and at a certain point, it becomes, I don't want to not tell someone when they join our group what our conventions are, because we already know them because we played so often that we don't need to say them to each other. But if we add somebody else in and we don't let them know that yeah. this is how we're playing, if, if if you weren't, then those first couple games with them is a different thing yeah. than the actual playing of Hanabi. Right. Which may or may not be interesting on it in its own right, but it's it, it, it's like um it's like an initiation into a fraternity, right? I'm gonna spend yeah. a while forcing you to do this thing that you don't really understand, so that you eventually learn our language. <laughs> yeah, or I could just tell you this is what we mean when we clue you. It means play the card ninety percent of the time, right? Um, we believe that when you're clued to multiple cards, you play them all from newest to oldest. The newest side of your hand is the right side of your hand. The oldest side of your hand is the left side of your hand, right? Like all that, those, these are how we play the game. And there are puzzles that are created out of those conventions that now we have to solve together. That is a different game than we don't have any rules. It's just a different game. Mm -hmm. It begs the question of, would you stretch that to other games? Is Twilight Struggle the same game when both players know all the cards and when both players do not know all the cards? I would argue that you, you could make a real good case that those are different games. Or you could say there is a broader sort of journey through Twilight Struggle and that no single play of Twilight Struggle is the platonic game of Twilight Struggle. Okay. I mean, at a certain point, you you hit the cliff, and then it's down to never <laughs> it's turtles st- all the way down. Well, right? no, you, you, you know, I can't remember who said it. It was he was Greek, I think. Uh, you never step in the same river twice, right? Right, it becomes that which right or the ship of Theseus idea, right? You keep replacing the wood, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. I um, tangential. I, I sometimes I describe Dominion as a game platform. Mm-hmm. Um, oh just yeah, yeah. Of the way that expansions have have kind of tacked on on things uh but there's kind of core dominion mechanics Mm -hmm. but based on which things you're adding to that it's just vastly different game but 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 there you're actually playing with different cards Uh, so to take your idea you know to the furthest extreme every possible kingdom of dominions kind of a different game well you know what, what, what do you do with that kind of variability well it's, right. it's the thing that magic created right it, it it exports most of the rules to something that's extremely variable so it's true yeah. that, that yeah yeah cards carrying rules and then different sets of cards being in a game you know but but let's take it to a much less extreme place and ask ourselves well in any given game of monopoly the subset of chance and community cards that come out are different sure yeah so is it a different game well you know I, I i think at a certain point what you get to is in all of these conversations is well it's a spectrum right yeah so monopoly, doesn't matter that much it's kind of a fractal kind of thing you have the game but then you also have the the game zoomed in you know and and all that. <laughs> yeah, and, and every so, turn's a game. <laughs> so yeah, every instance of the game shares some characteristics and qualities with every other instance and differs in some other ways. The superset of all the instances <laughs> of the game is in is in some way a way to define all the possible like the all the possible game states of a game of chess, right, which is, you know, an extremely large number, you can call chess, but you've missed chess if that's what you think of. And then if we zoom into the atomic level. <laughs> right, right, right. But it goes back, but, but having pushed this point to this ridiculous place, we come to realize what's been missing from it, which is mm-hmm. the game is not the things that happen in it. It's the decisions that we make about them. Mm, that's good. That's good. It's the gameplay, right? So Dominion offers us similar decisions, even though the mm-hmm. characteristics of the cards change. Once an expansion um, fundamentally changes the nature of the decisions, 
you start getting a different kind of game. So, you know, Alhambra is a game with, you know, a thousand expansions. There's a lot of those Euro games with, you know, these little bits that they don't really change the game. They just add a little like, oh, now there's gems. Now there's, you know, the merchant thief. Now there's, the, you know, it's the same thing. But then there are expansions that really make a different game out of this game that you were playing. That, that you know, um, I think that uh, Scoundrels of Skullport changes Lords of Waterdeep in a really, really big way because it creates in what was otherwise an action drafting worker placement game a push-your-luck element where you're going to be able to take more powerful actions in exchange for losing points potentially later and the size of point loss varies based on how many people pile in. That's a real different consideration than what's the best action for me. It's, that's for sure the best action for me as long as it doesn't as long as skulls don't become worth minus 10, but will they? You know, mm-hmm. that's a much bigger change to me, and I just don't see them as the same yeah. game anymore. Yeah, so in that case, the actual decisions, the gameplay made up of what's going on in your head when you take your turn is just different. The heuristic is different is maybe the way to say it, right? Okay. That The steps yeah. that I'm thinking about in... in you know, any drafting game, typically the decision that you think about is what is the best thing that remains? And then second level heuristic is, and will that come back to me? Right? Can I take something else instead of that? And it'll come back to me because it's not worth as much to everybody else. If you change that core heuristic, you're playing a different game. It may also have a drafting element in it, but it becomes a different game. And and so, I don't know, to me, that's a, a level of precision that's helpful Especially when you're designing and you're saying, okay, well, I want to include drafting in my game, but I don't want it to feel quite like all the other drafting games. How can I disrupt that? How can I subvert that? How can I turn that into something else? And and there's a few different ways to do it. You know, what if you have to draft things that are bad for you instead of things that are good for you? Well, okay, that changes things a little, but it still just feels maybe like I've swapped a positive for a negative, but I haven't done anything fundamentally all that exciting or different. What else do I need to do to make that change? Well, I need at some point to change the decision from I know the value to I'm not sure of the value. That changes a drafting game. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we've gone, you know, down a very specific rabbit hole, but that's why expressing these things precisely helps. It really opens up ways to think about it that you otherwise are stumbling around and you're like, oh, maybe this idea is good. Let me prototype that, try it at a play test, see that it falls apart on turn two, go back to the lab, try it again. You know, we shortcut that process. Mm-hmm. And kind of veering off a bit of your point about how the game is the decisions that you're presented with and make in the game, I think that kind of highlights something speaking as someone who tries to be a game critic that I find frustrating with a lot of games criticism is that the game is discussed by a lot of people as this like series of characteristics rather than something that provided an experience. It's okay. The theme is this, the artwork is nice. There's a little bit of this mechanism and a little bit of that mechanism. There's nothing communicated about the actual experience of playing the game. And it also frustrates me. I've run a, a, a column on the website monthly for the past few months where I just look at the way people try to sell their games on Kickstarter, the way they write about their own games on Kickstarter. And it's often the same thing. It's either absolutely nothing at all about the game and it's all about the setting. I won't even say theme. It's about the setting of the game or it's just a list of mechanisms. And it's like, well, I could take Mage Knight and I could take like a, a very casual D&D-ish, you know, dice chucking game. And <laughs> even more light and casual than that and describe them pretty much the same, but they couldn't be more different. Right, I see what you're getting at. The experience getting. of Mage Knight is about the in- intense card, the the puzzle solving of that hand of cards, mm-hmm. whereas the experience of Descent is kind of going on a jaunt. <laughs> well, wh- why do you think that that's true? I, I I mean, I agree with you that game critique can often be this like checklisty kind of the game had this and the game did that, and I thought it was pleasant. Right? What is it? 
that we're missing or, or why why is game critique trapped in that i mean part of it i think is to your point about language but i think p- the other part of it is another part not the other part i'll say another part of it is understanding that the point of a piece of criticism isn't to isn't just to write copy about the game right mm-hmm. it's not it's not the same thing as describing the game it's about starting a conversation about your experience in the game. I have a theory that a lot of reviewers don't have strong taste, that the reviewers that I find most helpful are the ones who are... I don't want to say that they're relatively narrow about the kinds of games that they like, although it is helpful. Like, if you want to play a great party game, you should listen to what Bruce Vogue says about party games, because he loves party games. But he also is really explicit about what he likes about them. Mm-hmm. But I like people who have n- n- not great taste, but who have taste. You know what I mean? Who have a perspective on what makes games good and fun and interesting. And even if that perspective isn't universally true and it's just true for them, for me, that's a better genre of game critique. Oh, sure. Absolutely. You know, and it's something that I, I think. So I don't see myself really as a reviewer. You know, I do a podcast. I do review games on it. And, you know, publishers do support that with review copies, most of which go to Eric and Don, who actually do the reviews for the most part. <laughs> so I don't I don't really see myself as a game reviewer in that sense. But I do see myself as someone who has pretty clear ideas about what I do and don't like. And I think about, um, not, you know... I agree that the experience is important, but it's not just the experience. I think it's easy for people to get into the experience of, oh, I like that it made me feel, you know, like it was spooky, right? Or I liked that the game felt, you know, thinky but not too thinky. Well, that's not super helpful. Right, right. The key is explaining why it happened. About it right, it's the helpful. warrant. But, but there's also, I mean, look, we're... we're I think still struggling to figure out what is good about good games and discovering that that space hasn't yet been fully mapped. So the very notion of cooperative games is part of that, right? It's like, well, humans have been doing this for 6,000 years. By the way, here's a new thing. And everyone's like, wow, that new thing's really awesome. Games are great for this. And we just didn't know that. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, so, so... I see it as a really unmapped space. I recently played Fortress America. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you played this? No. I know of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fortress- I have not heard of this. I've heard of it as like the epitome of Ameritrash. Right. So Fortress America, designed by Michael Gray, longtime Hasbro guy, and he was part of the Game Master series, right? So Access and Allies, Conquest of the Empire. Fortress America was one of those games from the Game Master series. Tons of plastic, tons of dice. And uh, Fantasy Flight recently released a new version of it, which was somewhat cleaned up, but really retained, I think, the same feeling of the original. And I strongly disliked the game because, well, the game was trying to model this this feeling of siege, right? So you have uh, one player plays the U.S., and then there's three other potential players who can be played by any number of one, two, or three players who are representing invasions from the West from the south and from the east. And basically, um, the U.S. player has to hold out for 10 turns without letting more than, I think it's 18 of their cities get conquered, or 12 of their cities, I forget exactly, whatever it is, but some number of their cities get captured. And I like that concept, right? That siege idea, I mean, Stronghold does that, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that tower defense feeling is kind of cool. But the way that the game executes it ultimately is that... The U.S. player receives reinforcements out of a deck of cards. And that deck of cards, it's real random where you're going to get troops and whether that's going to be anywhere useful to you and or not. And it makes it also very challenging on the other player to play strategically at all. So it just becomes this kind of random, oh, those reinforcements were helpful for you, so you survive another turn. Oh, that card didn't do anything for you, you didn't survive. So even at the level of design... It just feels like you're walking through, you know, you're doing a random walk through this deck of possibilities and either that'll, the distribution will swing enough to one side that they'll win or it'll swing enough to the other side that they'll win. Um, what also bothered me about the game, though, is it it feels like a 
a, a sort of a, an alt-right fantasy about, you know, both who U.S. enemies are and how the U.S. would survive. So, right, so so the names of the enemies, right, are like, the, it's the, the, um, the Euro-socialist uh, <laughs> army or something. And, right, it's very, and like the card text. You draw a card and it'll be like, you know, uh, NRA membership rises up in Wyoming. You know what I mean? And like these are the in, in, put four riflemen in Wyoming. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly how oh you know the car. Now, were it even more over the top and sort of farcical than like, okay, like I get that, right? But I don't know. You know, you play it, and I legitimately felt uncomfortable. Like I get that this is just a game, and this isn't. I'm not freaking out or whatever, but. That's not what I wanted to do tonight. You know what I mean? It's 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 like I, I told my dad once to read this book in which, you know, you don't really know it until the end. It's sort of Sixth Sense-ish, but this kid is dead in the end. And, and, and my dad read the book and he's like, you cannot give me books like that and not warn me. I have six <laughs> kids that is not cool. Isaac, not cool. And I didn't understand it at the time. But I get it, right? And like, that's the thing. Like, I didn't, I didn't need that tonight. Oh man, that reminds me of when Amber and I were on our honeymoon, we rented a cabin and they had a collection of DVDs and one of them was Chinatown and I'm a bit of a movie buff and I'd never seen Chinatown. That's Mm. certainly high on the list of like movies you got to see. So I'm like, oh, let's watch Chinatown. We're having a great time. And if I guess spoilers for a 40 year old movie, (laughs) Chinatown ends in a very depressing manner. (laughs) Basically... (laughs) The, uh, the the main female character who they're trying to save dies and the Jack Nicholson's character is told to just let it go and then they walk away and that's the end of the movie. Amber has not has not let up in how much she despises that movie because she was not ready for that. <laughs> right, and that's not a honeymoon movie, it turns out. No, 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 it was a, it was a bad choice. I mean, the, the selection was limited in terms of quality. Fair. I think I had a similar reaction to Memento. Um, oh, that's right. You hated Memento. Because when I have some distance from it, I can say, yes, I can see the film technique is incredible and the way they weave the story together, but I just can't stand how the 10 seconds of becoming a monster at the end of that movie, it just ruins the whole thing for me, and I just, I hate it. <laughs> Sorry, this was really off topic. Yeah, yeah quite a bit. What was? What, how did we get in here? Well, Fortress so we, America. Right. So we got here to from 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 Fortress America, and I brought that up because the experience that made me dislike the game. Yeah, I had some critique about the game mechanisms, and I had some critique about the experience as a player. But what I really what turned me off to the game mostly was the way it fit into our current political climate in a way that I did not want at my table. Regardless, and it's sort of, I don't want to say it doesn't matter what your politics are, because I'm sure that there's some people for whom that would have been an exciting, like, you know, F yeah game. Um, And that's fine. It's more that I had an experience through playing this game that made me say, well, games do have some social connection and and there is some responsibility on the part of the designer. And, you know, Mike Gray designed that game 25 years ago. Like, I'm not, you know, giving him a hard time. But as a game critic, what do I want to say about this game? I don't actually really want to talk about the deck mechanism very much. It's a stupid mechanism for an Ameritrash game, and that's fine. Like, whatever. I want to hear more people talking about not just social issues, but also those issues, right? And and some of the games that we're embracing these days, like some of these games that are coming out, like um, The Troubled Life of Billy Kerr, mm-hmm. right? Where people are excited about the opportunity for games to touch us in these different ways. I, I really liked... Um, Nyctophobia. It's not an especially good game, but it's... Oh, I want to play that. I hope that's at PAX. Um, I can bring it. (laughs) (laughs) It, it, It's not an especially good game. Like, I want to be very clear about that. And it has has as much need for GMing as as an actual role-playing game. Like, if you are the the murderer or the vampire or whatever, and you just play, like, bear by the rules, you're going to win every time, and nobody's going to really have a great time. Uh, And the rules even say, like, Hey, just because you can kill someone doesn't mean you should. Maybe you should walk away a little and let the tension build and let, you know. Okay, well, that's interesting. What's awesome about it is that on your turn, you're going to have to touch your piece and you're going to have to feel around your piece to decide where you want to go. And in order for that thing to happen, 
the murderer, the, the, the vampire, the GM, is going to take your hand while you're blindfolded and put it on your piece. And it is chilling to have that happen. Someone who does not have good intentions for you reaches out in the dark and grasps you. It does that! How does it do that? It, it's a game. There's nothing at stake and it makes you feel really horrified and creeped <laughs> out. Amazing. Amazing. And I can get that out of a LARP. I can get that out of a good book or a movie. I never got that out of a game. That's what I want to talk about. And I don't care that the game mechanisms are sort of weak. Oh, I completely agree. I mean, I've, I've slowly been kind of creating these, I don't know what to call them, little, I don't know, just statements about criticism I've been throwing out on Twitter every once in a while. And one of them is that, like, I don't want my job to be to try to predict what your opinion will be. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. Like, to me, like, the the exciting part of criticism is when you begin an interesting conversation or when you, when someone reads what you wrote and they see something from a different perspective. So who do you think is doing that well these days? Uh, my go-to is always, um, I can't remember his actual name, Space Biff, Dan Thoreau. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's really good. His reviews are always really solid. I think Shut Up and Sit Down gets it, mm -hmm. gets it pretty good a lot of the time mm -hmm. those would be the main two mm -hmm. i really like uh ben maddox uh who does a podcast called five games for doomsday before that he did a podcast uh with uh, yurgos panagatidis uh which was called uh, the perfect information podcast it was spectacular unfortunately they had a falling out and so they stopped doing it um but uh, if you're interested in specific games, definitely recommend uh, going back and listening to, to some of their work and, and mm -hmm. definitely check out uh, Five Games for Doomsday, which uh, intersperses board game reviews with interviews of designers framed around that idea of you can only take five games with you to the cabin that you're riding out the apocalypse <laughs> in. Um, and uh, there's somebody you might know in the second episode who might be sitting across from you. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, yeah. No, I, I, I really want to try to get more adventurous with with my criticism. I think, hopefully, people are responsive to it. I'm, I'm, I've been slowly, very, very slowly, and by slowly, I mean it's been kind of forming in my mind. Uh, my review of Fog of Love, which mm -hmm. I got like a year ago, and haven't had the courage to write up the review of it, but I think I had a completely unusual reaction to that game, and I don't know, hopefully, I'll get it out in the next couple of weeks. Listeners will have to check that out when it comes out. Have you played that game? <laughs> I haven't. It's it's something. <laughs> well, I, it's something. It I played it with Amber, which I don't know if that was the right. You should have played it with Bubba. <laughs> yeah, you and Bubba played it the the first time. Yeah, Bubba's a great partner. <laughs> just just to preview this review, the box says that it's it's a they advertise it as like a romantic comedy, the board game, and to me there was nothing comedic about it. <laughs> You were playing for all the marbles. <laughs> it was intense. It was intense. It also has a really, really interesting twist on the prisoner's dilemma from a, from a mechanical perspective that mm -hmm. it really kind of twists it. That's all I got. Man, we've been, that was a good discussion. Yeah, we've been yeah. at it for some time. Yeah, we should have. We just strung tangents together one after the other really nicely. <laughs> no, always happy to I'm excited to, to see. So th there is a forthcoming book. There is a forthcoming book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm really excited to see where that goes, and I got to check out your, your your blogging on the subject. In yeah, more so detail. That's it's really really interesting. Um, the book is going to be called Building Blocks: An Encyclopedia of Game Mechanisms. I think title that we've settled on, and that's with uh, with me and Jeff Engelstein. I don't know when it's going to come out. <laughs> I can tell you that we're hard at work on it and and polishing up our drafts and. Actually, we're really excited. Got uh, a third uh, third musketeer in with us, which is uh, Daniel Solis. And uh, Daniel is doing the uh, uh, diagrams that are going to come with uh, with the book. Oh, very nice. Uh, he's so good. Oh, my goodness. Uh, if you don't know Daniel Solis, very talented game designer and works at Indie Boards and Cards now as um, a graphic designer and producer there. And he also has a blog call or um, a project, I think it's a video project called Card at Work. So if you're a game designer and you want to learn about how he designs cards, 
you can check that out. There's a number of videos, and uh, so that's that's fantastic stuff. Really, really lucky to have him doing this with us. But yeah, so that book will come out, I don't know, sometime. I'll certainly let you know. But um, definitely if you're interested in following, I'm on Twitter as Kind Fortress. Kindfortress.com is my blog. And, uh, you know, all news about the book will be available through those channels. And if you want to listen to my show, it's called On Board Games. It's at onboardgames.net. It's a weekly podcast uh, where we talk mostly about board game industry. So we do some game reviews and we always have interesting industry guests. And we kind of talk about uh, a lot of the business side of games. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on. This was Thanks for fun. coming. Thank you this for was inviting awesome. Me into your home and feeding me pizza. It was excellent. <laughs> Thanks for having the courage to uh, come over to someone's house <laughs> you've never met in person <laughs> to, before. To the murder Shack, which, which is, by the way, what we affectionately call Mark's house. I, I'm just That's telling absolutely all the audience, not true. I just want all the audience out there to know I am blinking twice. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll, I'll look at the camera. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Don't forget to check me out on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. And please rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever uh, you listen your podcasts from. And if you'd like to watch our podcasts live and get all kinds of other awesome rewards, including getting on our great Discord server where we talk about all kinds of things, board games and not board games, whatever's on our mind, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. We greatly appreciate any contributions that you can give. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>